Hello there, folks. I'm Dustin Cormier. This is How to Rock Astrology. We're continuing our reading on the divine forces of the lunar nakshatras as portrayed in the Vedas by the author known as Radha. <clears throat> Today we are going to have a little uh, pointed discussion talking about her idea of interpreting the results of planets placed in the lunar nakshatras. There's a lot to cover here. Uh, there's many ways of deriving the health and condition of any planet in its sign and in its house in Vedic astrology. Uh, and it is going to be a whole secondary, uh, a whole different energetic sphere uh, understanding with regards to the planet's place in the Rashis and in the in the houses and etc. Everything related to tropical astrology is completely different and is a completely different energetic mythos from the narrative and the personality and characteristics derived from the planet's placement in the nakshatras. So the nakshatras and their characteristics. Then there is the tropical rashis and the houses and jyotish. Jyotish shastra consciousness is quite different from nakshatra consciousness. But a clever astrologer will have the ability to marry them in their intuitive understanding of how the themes of a planet and the themes of that planet as a lord of this or that house and sign, as being involved in yo whatever yogas they are in the chart, etc. A good Jyotishi can derive the themes of the planet in tropical Rashi astrology, in Parashara astrology, in Jaimini, and etc. And take those meanings and archetypes and interpenetrate them with the position of that planet in its nakshatra, specific to this season of the nakshatra's place in the Rashis. Because, of course, the nakshatra positions change where they are in the Rashis every 2,000 years or so. This is due to the procession of the equinox, which you can hear more about in preceding episodes. So, let's take a look at how Radha considers the interpretation of the results of the lunar nakshatras and planets in them. In this book, we're going to talk, we're going to have chapters that talk about the nakshatra Devata, the deity that rules the nakshatra. And each nakshatra devata chapter is going to conclude with a highlight of the key personality traits, the indications or the inclinations or the vasanas, and the life themes for a native whose lagna or moon occupies the nakshatra under discussion, as well as other planets, uh, talking about some qualities of other planets falling in that place. So, where it's deemed instructive, one or two notable individuals whose charts emphasize the same nakshatra are included and commented upon. Of course, this will be a sidereal derivation, which means that for us tropical Rashi astrologers, we have to note that it's probably not the person, you know, she gives examples of people whose ascendant or moon is in a nakshatra but she will derive the rashi of that position the sign she will derive from sidereal rashi based astrology so we might have to give some uh we have to discern when that bias is there should the chart be that of an author the nakshatra characteristics may be expressed or channeled through the subject matter of that author's books and if they're an actor, often the nature of the nakshatra is aptly displayed through the actor's principal character roles. There are many astrologers that talk about this on YouTube already. Um, there's a girl 
that talks about the beauty nature of all the nakshatras uh, and I like her work a lot although it is sidereal again <clears throat> an important caveat regarding this section of each chapter is that the actual manifestation and magnitude of the traits and life experiences described are highly dependent upon the overall chart terrain and the nature of the graha, the planet, involved. This includes its pava, its house placement, and its rulerships, its planetary condition, its yogas, its planetary combinations, and so on. These are all Parashari, Jyotisha Shastra related stuff. Tropical Rashi astrology, etc. Thus, it is important for the reader to fully assess each client's chart before summarizing the probable impact of any one nakshatra. With that said, the following are a few general guidelines for interpreting the effects of the lunar nakshatras, and this is not intended as an all-inclusive listing. Nakshatras may be used for predicting the behavior of any graha in the birth chart, as well as any house cusp, be it the moon, Saturn, Jupiter, Venus, or the lagna, or as I've said, any of the bhava cusps, the bhava chalitas. A graha expresses, <laughs> it expresses its nisargika, its inborn or permanent nature, through the attributes, qualities, and shakti of its nakshatra placement. So the nisargika qualities of a planet, it refers to that planet's significations that are constant or that are irrespective of the lagna, the rising sign. It's the karika nature of the graha. For example, in all birth charts, the sun is the significator for self-esteem, health, vitality, recognition, and the heart as well as the father. These are all true irrespective of the lagna. Leo risings take this sun, these things symbolize the sun to mean something different than what a Gemini, how a Gemini experiences these universal traits of the sun. But the traits of the sun will always be universal, no matter the lagna. For another example, Mercury represents all forms of communications, commerce, the rational mind, as well as friends, and so on. So the Nisargika Grahas are categorized as benefic, Subha, or fierce, Kura. Sarvat Chintamani defines those Grahas considered Krura, and this is what we can describe here. All the other Grahas are considered benef uh, beneficially inclined, but the Krura Grahas are Mars and Saturn in the Sun. As well, the Moon, when it is within 72 degrees on either side of the Sun, uh, meaning like pushed in uh, within the first, essentially, when the Moon is in the same sign as the Sun, it's in the second house from the Sun, or the third house from the Sun, or when it's in the twelfth house from the Sun, or when it's in the eleventh house from the Sun. These, according to Radha, are considered to be a benefic moon. Uh, I've actually, I associate the benefic moon to be any moon that is waxing towards the full moon. And the closer the full moon, the better. Uh, that's a Parashari derivation that it does not come from Sarvachintamani. That's my personal bias. So Mercury is also a malefic or a Krura planet when it is associated with the Sun, Saturn, or Mars, or a malefically inclined moon. When it's uh, associated in the same sign. And it's when it's with more malefics than benefics. When, it's the, with, when Mercury is right next to a benefic and a malefic, if you want to know which nature it's blending into, because Mercury just blends into the nature of whatever planet it's, is around it. And if it is beside a benefic and a malefic, you can derive its nature from whatever planet it's closer to. 
So the other, pl other planets and an unafflicted Mercury and the full moon, these are considered benefics. A benefic nisargica graha tends to emphasize the more auspicious qualities of its nakshatra. So an inherently benefic planet such as Venus, uh, Mercury next to a, malef next to a benefic, uh, the benefic moon, and Jupiter. These grahas emphasize the more auspicious qualities of their nakshatra. A fierce or krura graha, it's Mars, Saturn, Sun, malefic moon, and malefic Mercury. These may afflict the energy sphere, the energy grid of the nakshatra itself, creating issues or challenges relative to the nakshatra's significations and consistent with the nature of the graha, the planet in question. Importantly, a graha, or planet, also expresses its tatkalika, or temporary nature. Unlike a planet's nisargika nature, which is not based on the lagna, a planet's tatkalika nature is solely determined by the lagna. So the planets have auspicious or inauspicious qualities relative to the nature of the rising sign that is experiencing them. Uh, I find generally, not always, but ge this, this basically goes from the friendships, the friendship nature of the planets. It also has to do with whether a planet is ruling, the, the signs that a planet rules are auspicious houses in the, to, to the Lagna. And, you know, some houses are always evil. For example, if a planet's sign rules the 11th house of a Lagna, then it is almost always going to have inauspicious qualities associated with it. Just as an example. <clears throat> so, each graha is the bhavesha, or the lord, the ruler of a bhava. For those bhavas, or houses, ruled by its rashi, its sign. For example, in a chart with an Aries lagna, Aries rising, Venus is the bhavesha for the second bhava, ruled by Taurus, as well as the seventh bhava, ruled by Libra. So the bhava is, of course, a house. So in an Aries rising, Venus is the lord of the second and the seventh house. However, for a Sagittarius rising, a Sagittarius lagna, Venus is the bhavesha for the sixth and eleventh bhavas or houses, which is ruled by Taurus and Libra, respectively. The bhavesha of the lagna, the rising sign, receives the special, the special designation of the Lagnesha, the king of the Lagna. The planet that rules the rising sign is called the Lagnesha, the Ascendant Lord. Notation for a Grava's Bhava placement and rulership is specified by Radha, the author, as the Bhava Bhavesha. For example, a Graha placed in the second Bhava and or one that is the second Pavesha is noted as the second Pava Pavesha. Graha placed in the second Pava and one that is the second Pavesha is known as the second Pava Pavesha. So like for a Leo rising, Mer Virgo rules the second house. And a Virgo that is the second lord in the second house is noted as the second Pava Pavesha. Paveshas owning auspicious bhavas, which is essentially every bhava except for the third, the sixth, the eighth, and the twelfth, they behave as temporal benefics for that particular lagna. Paveshas owning inauspicious bhavas, which is the third, the sixth, the eighth, and the twelfth, and the eleventh in my derivation, these act as temporal malefics. I should note that my derivation comes from my training with Asheville Vedic Astrology. And I believe it's a Parashara technique. I'm not sure the derivation at this present time. So, as with Nisargika ben Benefics and Malefics, a planet that is... Uh, 
how you would say tatkalika benefic or temporarily benefic to the lagna. This often reinforces and supports the ingrained behavior of a nakshatra. So for example, if you are a Gemini rising, one of the auspicious planets is the fifth lord. For a Gemini rising, Libra is the fifth house, which so uh, that's an auspicious house. Even though Gemini's fifth lord is also uh, Venus, also rules the twelfth house, which is Taurus. The auspiciousness of the fifth house overrides the malefic evil nature of the twelfth house. Even though it does still, Venus's fifth lord, Venus, does cause some damage, some egoic intrigue due to the twelfth house psychological desire for comfort through Venus. Ultimately, it's still auspicious. And therefore, uh, Venus generally for a, a Gemini rising, since it's a temporarily benefic planet, it tends to reinforce and support the ingrained, be, the ingrained behavior of a nakshatra, of the nakshatra that it's in for a Gemini rising. Now a temporal malefic, uh, an example of this might be the sun, for example, which rules the third house for a Gemini rising, which is also already a little bit of a malefic that caught that puts pressure on the nakshatra because sun is a naturally crura or cruel malefic planet a temporal malefic like the sun for a gemini rising was more likely to afflict or distort the nakshatra's significations uh this is doubly so because it's doubly malefic in this chart of a gemini rising above all else the condition of a graha is important. A Nisargika benefic, a, a planet which is inherently benefic, such as Jupiter, even if it is also a Tatkalika benefic, it can negate the auspicious indications of its nakshatra when it is poorly conditioned, such as being combust or debilitated. Like if the Jupiter is in Capricorn, it's debilitated. And even for us, um, you know, a Leo rising who has, uh, I guess a better example would be an Aries. Even for an Aries or a Scorpio rising, Scorpio would be a better bet. So let's consider a Scorpio rising for whom Jup Jupiter rules the second and fifth Bhavishas, uh, or Bhavas rather, uh, the fifth has an auspicious quality and the second is neutral. So, therefore, Jupiter is quite auspicious and is a temporal benefic to a Scorpio. Jupiter is already a Nisargica, a natural benefic. So, it, you would think that it has absolute positive qualities. But, even a Nisargica and Tatkalika benefic, such as Jupiter, even, even if it's benefic to the Lagna, like a Scorpio, can still negate the, the auspicious indications of Jupiter. It can still negate the auspiciousness of a nakshatra when it is poorly conditioned by being combusted or debilitated. Such as if you have Jupiter combusted by the sun in the sign of Capricorn, uh, it will probably ruin the indications of the nakshatra that it falls in, whether that's Purva, Ashada, or what have you. Uh, I believe it'd be either Purvashada or whatever it is, whatever nakshatra it's in. Likewise, a Nisargika planet, which is naturally malefic, such as Mars, and which is Tatkalika, which is temporarily malefic also. For example, in the chart of a Gemini rising, Mars rules the 6th and the 11th house, and it's considered temporarily as well as inherently malefic. So, Mars being temporarily as well as permanently benefic for a Gemini rising, if it is well conditioned and it's appropriately placed, if it's exalted in Capricorn, if it has a trine from its friend Jupiter or the Sun, such a Mars has the capacity of expressing the more positive attributes of its nakshatra. 
The topic of planetary condition is beyond the scope of this introductory section on the use of the lunar nakshatras in this book. But the reader is advised to consult Jyotisha Shastra for a more comprehensive discussion on planetary condition. This is essentially, you know, if you've been watching my Light on Life series, that book will describe, for example, in English, the Jyotisha Shastra that conditions the planet in the ways that we're talking about. And this is a necessary way of understanding how the planet is going to color the nakshatra, as well as how the nakshatra's potentials are going to be fully reached by the capacity of the planet to cha channel those nakshatra qualities purely through the pure vidya of that planet in its sign dignity, whether it has the purity, whether it has the capacity to channel the positive qualities of that nakshatra, depends on the condition of that planet in Jyotish. Lastly, the Jyotisha classification of a nakshatra is often noted for the purpose of gaining further insight into its qualities and characteristics. These characteristics include the following. I'm, I've talked about a few of these already, but this is just a few of them. Gana or Guna uh, in, considers the nakshatras to be either divine, Deva, human, Manusha, or demonical, Rakshana, Rakshasa rather. Then there's the energy or Shakti, the, what I call the nature of the nakshatras. This is Dhruva, Kshipra, Ugra, Mridu, Tiksha, Mridu Tikshna, Ka, and Kata. There's also the Vedic yoga or aim of the nakshatras, the Purushartha, which includes the purpose or dharma yoga, livelihood or artha yoga, desire or kama yoga, and spiritual liberation or moksha. As well, there's the element or the tattva der derivation, as well as the caste derivation. For the most part, I've included most of these in my... Uh, video describing the nakshatra qualities and characteristics. It's hard to know which really are the more important derivations. These are the ones given in this book. Uh, it's important for us to know that Radha does consider those characteristics important in her qualification of the nakshatras. So this has been good stuff folks. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, we've just talked about how to interpret using the nakshatras uh, and combining that reading with the planetary conditions that we might derive from classical Parashara and Jaimini Jyotish method. Stay tuned in the next episode. That was a little bit of an astronomical thesis. Now we're going to get a little bit more into the archetypal mythos guts of the, der the original derivation of the divine forces of the Rig Veda. Stay tuned for the next one, folks. If you're enjoying this, feel free to like, drop me some comments. Feel free to subscribe because we got lots more coming through in this series. Thanks so much for watching.